Thank you for the introduction. Does it work? Yes. Uh, so, as you've heard, we are in, in our professional lives, we are active in computational uh, finance and, and in industrial mathematics, but what I'm going to speak about in the next 20 minutes or so is a kind of well, a fun project in our company, namely that we are um, developing a so-called density functional theory code um, in, in the Wolfram language in, or in Mathematica. Um, don't be frightened by the term, I explain in a minute what it is. So in, in a nutshell, what it allows you to do is to, to compute uh, all sorts of, of material properties from very little knowledge, basically from just uh, knowledge about basic quantum mechanics and, and natural constants. Um, the dream behind the whole endeavor is that we would very much like to be able to solve this equation. This is Schrodinger's equation, as some of you might know, and well, it basically contains, well, almost all of chemistry. It contains almost all of material science, which ranges from steel production down to nanotechnology, which it in itself contains, well, semiconductor industry as a special case. It would tell you all about, well, molecular biology, drug design. Basically, if your system is made of atoms, and that's a lot around here, um, it is governed by the Schrodinger equation. And well, let me stress again that if you could solve this equation, um, you could basically answer every question about those systems uh, without needing any prior knowledge or without needing any empirical data. You just could compute it from basic laws of science. Of course, this probably sounds a bit good, too good to be true, and it, it certainly is. So le let, me, let me quickly show you what, what the problem is what you see here is an ethane molecule. It's probably the simplest molecule or one of the simplest molecules you could encounter. It consists of, of two carbon atoms, which are those bl two black balls here, and uh, six hydrogen atoms here at the ends. And what you cannot see because they are, they are so fast is a cloud of 30 electrons, which is moving quickly around this molecule and basically glues it together. So what Schrodinger's equation does is uh, that if you solve it, it yields you what is called the wave function. And the wave function uh, basically describes the state of, of this electron cloud that, that moves around here. And actually, if you really could solve Schrodinger's equation, it would give you an infinite series of such wave functions where each describes a different energy state of the molecule. But to make life simple today, we are, I'm focusing on on what is called the ground state, which is the, the lowest energy state of the molecule, which is the, actually the most interesting property most of the time. So this strange wave function depends on the coordinates of all the electrons in, in this electron cloud. So for 30 electrons, this makes 90 coordinates in, in three-dimensional space. So if you would now go ahead and kind of naively discretize uh, this wave function, and if you would say use 20 grid points in each coordinate direction, you would need eight times 20 to the power of 90 bytes to store the function. This sounds like an awful large number, so let me quickly illustrate how large it is. It's if you would have some kind of hypothetical future storage medium where you could store one byte on each atom, this is probably the highest storage density humanity can, can ever hope to achieve. This would allow you to store a billion petabytes on the volume of an SD card. Enough for your holiday photos, I, I hope. Um, so how much volume would you need of this medium to store the wave function of, of this simple ethane molecule? If you do the math, um, you will end up with 1.6 uh, times 10 to the 39th cubic light years. So um, this is roughly, very roughly, uh, one million times the size of the universe. So this, I, I think you can rightfully call that big data. Um, of course, th this is just to convince you that it's, it's never going to be practical to really go that route and solve Schrodinger's equation directly for the wave function. So people have, well, found all sorts of clever ways around it and all sorts of clever approximations. And I'm going to talk about density functional theory or DFT as physicists usually call it here. It's not the most accurate approximation, but it's, it has become immensely popular in, in the past few years, in the past decade, because it offers a very, um, well, a very good trade-off between accuracy and, and computational effort to reach that kind of accuracy. 
It is based on, on two theorems by, by Pierre Hohenberg and Walter Kohn, who got awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 98 for his findings, together with uh, John Popel, who was uh, the first guy who made these calculations practical. So, in, in simple words, the first theorem tells you the density is special, and the density is something, the electron density is something you could compute if you had the wave function. And it basically tells you if you look at a certain point in space, if you look there, what is the probability of finding any electron there? So it is a function in one variable, and it's a much, much, much simpler object than the wave function. The wave function would need these, these millions of universes to store it, while the density might boil down to, say, a few hundred kilobytes to a few hundred megabytes. What this theorem tells you is something extremely astonishing. It tells you that you can turn this relation around and start from the density and you have a unique way from that density to calculate the wave function, which means that those two very different objects contain the very same information. So everything that is contained in this huge wave function is also contained in the density. In principle, this is one of those mathematical existence theorems that tells you it's in there, but it doesn't tell you how to get it out. Um, in even simpler words, it, it tells you everything you might ever want to calculate about a quantum mechanical system is contained in a density alone. The density is everything you will ever need. And physicists like to put this in more mathematical terms and say everything is a functional of the density. And this is what gave the theory its name. Um, now, what makes it somewhat more practical is the second theorem, which, uh, don't look at the slide, it, it looks too complicated. It's what the second theorem tells you is that also the energy is something very special. Um, the energy, of course, can only depend on the density because everything depends on the density. And the second theorem tells you if you would have a way to compute the energy for a given density, then the one density uh, that gives you the smallest energy is the ground state density you are looking for. So if you could compute it, this would give you a way to, to look for the ground state density. Of course, we cannot compute it, but at this point, people have found clever approximations, and instead of the real thing, you are minimizing the, the approximation. And well, in the past, say, 50 years of density functional theory, people have made huge progress in, in finding very good approximation in, in, in this field. Um, to give you a short idea on, on how much effort these calculations are, um, I compiled this table here. It's, it's the simple ethane molecule you've seen would probably take seconds. And so this is something you can do on your iPhone and, and take a few megabytes of, main mem of memory at runtime. I recently did a calculation of a fullerene. This is, is a kind of a football, okay, I'm in the United States. I should say a soccer ball of, of carbon atoms. And it took uh, roughly four hours, uh, five hours on, on one core and needed a few gigabytes. So this is a bit larger. And uh, the largest calculations I've recently come across is, I, I didn't do that, that last one myself. This was done in by a Japanese group, is a silicon nanowire consisting of, I think, roughly 15,000 silicon atoms and, and 60,000 electrons. And the calculation consumed 1.1 million core hours. And charging from the data they gave in the paper probably needed a few terabytes at, at, at runtime. Um, so it, it can get very demanding, but simple systems, basically nowadays with today's computers, can be done even, even on, on iPads or iPhones. Um, so le let me show you an example what you can do. Uh, actually, let me skip to the next example. Um, what you see here is, is a benzene molecule. You see that the structure of the benzene molecule here on the right side is it's a ring of six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms around here. And this poor guy has been put in a, in a strong magnetic field. And what you see here on the left-hand side is, is electrical currents that get induced by, by this applied magnetic field. The reason why we want to calculate this is, is to calculate nuclear magnetic resonance spectra. You, you know NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, probably from, from hospital or from your doctor, from these NMR scans. There it's, it's your body that gets um, subjected to this magnetic field and the currents get induced in all the molecules in your body. And the reason why one does it is that uh, these currents strongly depend, obviously, on the chemical structure of the molecule. 
So different structure means different currents, and you can indirectly measure them by um, because those currents in turn induce a secondary magnetic field, and at the positions of some of the atoms, you have isotopes that have a spin. So this is like a small little compass needle, and you can tickle this compass needle by, by a, a radio pulse and measure its, its resonance frequency, and this frequency gets detuned depending on, on the magnetic field there, which again depends on the currents, which again depend on, on, on the chemical structure of the molecule. So in this very indirect way, you can conclude back from, from the output of the machine to the chemical structure of the molecule. In, in the NMR scan at your doctors, this is used to, to have contrast between different tissues. But in analytical chemistry, this is used to really find out what, what substance it is. And people have used and compiled huge databases of kind of empirical data that allows you to, to conclude back to the structure. And there's a lot of empirical knowledge. The reason why we like to do it is, is we think it would, be, it would be nice if you could solve the inverse problem by, by a computer, by generating, calculating the, the output and, and then turning things around and concluding from the output of such a machine to, to the chemical structure. Um, the other very different example I wanted to show you, uh, here it is, is, is from semiconductor theory. It's th th this, is, this picture is a photo I took from a publication. It shows you a semiconductor, so these are 500 nanometers here with some electrodes on top and well, I, I did a, a short little kind of fun research project on this. Uh, what, what these electrons do is they push electrons away, so electrons can only move freely in this, this dark gray area and people are interested in what happens around, around these dots. So having DFT in Mathematica, I, well, I first edited a picture a bit and removed the errors and the red dots because they are not really part of the physical system. Uh, so electrons can move here, so I used Mathematica to turn this into a black and white image, so electrons can now move in, in the white part. Um, well, I did a bit of edge detection and, and meshed the remaining area. And so because we are just interested in what happens around here, I also removed the, the, this, these wedges down, down here. So uh, I ended up with something like this. Now, um, okay, if you, we also agreed on a kind of potential. This is a bit of empirical input here. That these electrons might fail and then, well, with that input, you can go, go ahead and do the density functional theory calculation in Mathematica. And the, the point here, this is very simple. It's actually two Mathematica commons. One is kind of used to set up common things that you can reuse for more calculations, and then, then there is another Mathematica common just to start the calculation. My, my point here is that you don't need to be an expert on density functional theory to do that. This could be done by, say, an experimental physicist or so. Um, once you have done the calculation, you can use Mathematica to, to analyze uh, your results for, well, let me skip that. For instance, this, this is the density, which is, uh, as you have probably guessed, an important quantity in density functional theory. This plot here shows you that the electrons are really sitting at, at those two dots, which was not very clear from the outset. But there is a finite probability that electrons might also spill out here. Um, yeah, so th this is probably more interesting for physicists. You can, using Mathematica, you can now also uh, make your simple, nice user interfaces to explore different, different aspects of, of the system. So I, I hope you, you like the example. So um, just to give you a flavor of what, what we can do. Um, so why, why did we choose Mathematica to do that? Um, if you speak to physicists, this usually needs a bit of justification because the traditional languages are either Fortran or C++. And the word traditional is probably not strong enough, you should say. That there are two religions. And basically, one motivation was that we thought, well, a bit of heresy now and then could be great fun. Um, the other reason was that I, I didn't want this large monolithic kind of simulation code, but more, more rapid development environment to try out new ideas. So um, I'm in the lucky position that I've been uh, part of, over time, part in, in three different density functional theory, 
read teams and I've been part in the development of a Fortran code, of a C++ code, and now I did it in Mathematica. So I'd like to show you a, a simple comparison, but, but please let me show this disclaimer here. This is, I mean, this is anecdotal evidence. It's not a benchmark I'm showing you, so don't, don't believe the numbers. Orders of magnitude are probably significant, but if ignore factors of two. Um, the first question people usually ask is, is it fast enough? Well, this is, um, come on, this is not fast enough. Uh, what I show you here is, is, is two results for a very simple system we, we used to, well, to check if, if the results are okay, where the C++ code came in at 4.1 seconds and Mathematica at 4.5, so this is practically the same for this Fullerin calculation. Uh, C++ took uh, five and a half hours, Mathematica five hours 55, so this is also practically the same because, I mean, it, it could be the other way around if you just uh, tune a, a few parameters a bit differently. Um, the type of efficiency I, I usually mind more than, than efficiency at runtime is actually my time. Uh, how, how long does it take me in, in developing the thing? So. Again, this is a very rough comparison. This, the Fortran code um, uh, used about, uh, needed about uh, 50,000 lines of code just well for the numerical simulation and took about um, roughly three person years to develop. Uh, to give you a, a kind of a scale of comparing because I mean, the features of those codes don't exactly overlap. So to, to give you a scale to judge how, how how many features a code supports. I've introduced this percent scale where I normalize the older Fortran code of at 100%. So the C++ code was uh, 20,000 lines of code, took one and a half years to develop, and it supports basically 80% of what, what the Fortran code can do. And Mathematica, the Mathematica code is, is the youngest one. It has uh, actually two parts, a finite element package, a small one, which uh, consumed 860 lines of code, but this, is, uh, this was done uh, at Mathematica 9, and now Mathematica 10 contains a finite element package, so this is soon going to be obsolete. And the actual, actual density functional theory code uh, weighs 300 lines of Mathematica code. So this is, it's really amazing how much you can do with, with just 300 lines of code, and it took uh, roughly 70 hours to, to develop it. So this thing tells me I'm, I'm running out of time. So let me let me conclude by well by trying to give you an idea what, what I'm up to here. The, the way these calculations are traditionally performed is is uh, that a professor goes and finds a PhD student and then applies for a grant to to finance the PhD student. And after some years, you you pick up your results. And I think this is still fine if you do calculations that really push the boundaries of, of what we can do today. But my argument is that in the past 30 years or so, we have pushed the boundaries so far that behind them there is a, a huge realm of much simpler calculations that, that should be much more accessible to, to maybe a, a public audience. And um, actually, the, the so-called chemical space, this is the space of all chemical compounds you could form by, by all the elements in the periodic table is, is actually huge. It, it probably takes also a few million of universes to store. So there is no way of, of compiling empirical data or, or measurement data on, on all possible chemical structures. But at least for simple to medium structures, this gives you a way to actually compute uh, the quantities you want to know about that structures. And what I would really like to see is that in a few years I can go to do something like this and go to Wolfram Alpha and enter something like benzene nuclear magnetic resonance shift and Wolfram Alpha comes back and tells me, well, there is no database that contains what you want to know, but I did compute it for you. And this should at least work for simple molecules. If you come along with your 60,000 electron silicon nanowire, it might probably say you need to buy more cloud credits to do that or something like this. So there is another two minutes, so thank you for your attention.